to the last presentation. Our presenter today, Ellen Compesto. She is a she has a story with the family background why he chose the title combatancy. His uh, her father was a policeman and also her brother a policeman and army. So it's very interesting to listen her presentation today. Let us give the time to her. Good afternoon, everyone. This is my final title. <laughs> Christians' participation in the, in the military service during the first three centuries and church fathers' councils about their participation. So since there's no more time, I will just quickly read it. At present, Military service is either mandatory or voluntary depending on the country a person is a, cit is a citizen of. Interestingly, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has members who belong to the armed forces. And this uh, very short statement leads me to the main bur burden of my paper, which is to present Christians' participation in the military service. Queries that arose in relation to the topic that are of primary concern are first, when, when did Christians start to become soldiers and what are the reasons for their participation in the military service? Second, how did the church fathers respond to Christians joining the Roman army? And third, what are the guidelines that can be set for Christians nowadays who want to join the military service? Significance of the study. SDA's long-standing view with regards to the military service is that the church held a non-combatant position. However, in reality, there are a handful of SDA's who are in their rank and file by choice and not by force. This paper hopes to shed light why the members should reflect seriously their decisions in joining the armed forces. Well, for those who maintain their affiliations, this research desires to put limits to their actions while well on active service, thus upholding the ideals of the denomination. The delimitation of my study, this paper will not discuss the biblical concepts and basis of Christians' participation in the military service. Also, it will not include the history of Christians pertaining to military service after the first three centuries and lastly, the non-combatancy position of the SDA Church will also be omitted in the, in the argument. The first and the third, the reason is because I will be presenting in the seminar colloquium this month, so I will not include that in the presentation this afternoon. Well, one of the possible reasons why Christians started to joined the military service in the first three centuries is because their living conditions were really carefully studied. A prime example is during Emperor Septimius Severus reign. Develops, developments were seen such as raise of the salary, lands were distributed, and security of the family was provided. Consequently, this led to an elevated status, thus an increase in the number of military Men. And this is a well-known fact that some men are encouraged to join because of the advantages that they can get out of being military men. So now we proceed to the evidences of participation of Christians in military service. First are military martyrs. As early as the rule of Emperor Diocletian, in the years 284 to 305, there were Christian soldiers serving in the Roman army. For example, Marinus, who was a seasoned soldier and was one rank before becoming a centurion. Marcellus, who was a first cohort centurion, meaning he was operating 160 men. Julius, who was a re-enlisted re veteran. 
that shoes is C shoes and Dipa shoes who was a veteran. So these soldiers became military martyrs during this time. Thundering Legion. A famous story about the Thundering Legion circulated in 173, Emperor Marcus Aurelius fought with the Quadius, and when his soldiers were thirsty, that would have led to an easy defeat the 12th legion, who were Christians, started to pray and ask for God's help. Then a thunderstorm arose and that brought relief and victory to the Romans, but scared their enemies away. Thus, hereafter, the 12th legion was known as the Fulminata or Fulminea or Thundering. Next are the Armenian soldiers. Thaddeus and Bartholomew we know as the first disciples in the New Testament, they preach in they preach in Armenia and they shared the gospel there. And in fact, Armenia became the first Christian nation in AD 303. However, when Maximian Dia desired to impose paganism and repudiate Christianity, the Armenians fought for their religion, and surprisingly, they won. Well, it was like a sign that God was blessing them because Christianity won instead of paganism. And other evidences, it's a fact that Christians joined the Roman army even before the time when Constantine became involved in the history of the Christian church. And although the church objected to this, however, they did not exclude them from communion or membership and even allow the writings in their epitaphs to document their profession as soldiers. For example, one soldier from Persia, one from Besancon, and six from Rome. Furthermore, some members of the Roman army started to be converts, uh, as is the case whenever some, a Christian is in a working place, there will be converts, especially if that person is a real Christian. Chapter three. Now we go to the councils of the church fathers about some Christians, uh, some Christians who participated in the army, meaning how did the church react to those Christians who are actively in the military service? A preferred reason for Christians being prohibited to join military service is because of idolatrous practices and certain practices that were not in harmony with Christian beliefs and values were asked to be carried out by Christian soldiers. And this is particular, particularly true in the case of Tertullian. Well, Tertullian was a church father, and he was a son of our Roman centurion, which is debatable. From paganism, he was converted into Christianity in in 170 and later became an ordained presbyter in Carthage. Moreover, it was Tertullian who addressed heavily the issue about the presence of Christians in the army in the closing years of the second century. I tried to study the rest of the church fathers, but it was him who spoke more of that issue. In fact, he is in fact, uh, together with Origen, he is one of the promoters of pacifism during the entire pre-Constantinian period. This is about early Christians in the mili military. Tertullian's earliest conviction ab about the military was that he acknowledged the necessity of Christians' involvement in just wars. He confirmed that Christian soldiers were responsible for the success of the Germanic wars as a result of their prayers. He wrote, without ceasing, for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire, for protection to the imperial house, for brave armies, a faithful senate, a virtuous people, the world at rest, whatever as man or Caesar, an emperor would wish. Nonetheless, after joining Montanism, which is a heretical movement, the belief about the dichotomy became prevalent in his writings. 
His strong opposition in the participation of Christians in the military service started to be evident in his works, the Corona and the Idolatria. Meaning that uh, Tertullian before approved of Christians participating, but when he became a heretical member of the church, then he did not approve of it anymore. And one of his books, The Corona, the background is on February 4th, 211, Emperors Caracalla and Geta ascended on the throne due to their fellow ruler and father's death. Furthermore, on that day, the new emperors presented donativum to every soldier. In response, the soldiers declared their military oath, which affirmed their allegiance to the new rulers. However, on this particular event, a Christian soldier refused to wear the laurel garland or the traditional military crown worn by all soldiers that resulted to everyone's dismay. Because as we know, in the, in the army, there are rules that everyone needs to pay attention to. And if you, you're the only one who does not follow, then you will be a subject of scorn. Nevertheless, Tertullian approves of his courage and wrote the corona to attack the idolatrous truths character of the military crown. And thus we go to chapter 11 of the corona, wherein Tertullian did not just deal with the soldier, so the case of the soldier who was, who got the rest of the soldiers dismayed, but he dealt with the weightier, weightier issue about the participation of Christians in the military service. He raised questions like, first, should we allow another master to lord over us except God? Because it's a fact that when you're a soldier or maybe a policeman, your number one boss is not God but the government. Second, was it right to abandon the family for the sake of the military profession? Because, of course, when you are an army, you are always away. Third, could we use the sword and any form of violence as opposed to the teachings of Christ? We know that soldiers punish through using the sword or in our time now, gun. Fourth, was it justifiable to work on the Lord's Day? This is very common. Are, it's like, are guards allowed to work on Sabbath days? So soldiers are not an exception to this question. Next, would a Christian soldier eat the food offered to idols during pagan feasts? Which, which is a um, debatable issue back then. And lastly, should he be cremated as part of the ritual for armies upon death? when Christ already suffered the eternal punishment by fire in his stead. Thus, the polemicist concluded that the aforementioned queries were offenses to Christianity and an act of desertion from the camp of light into the camp of darkness. He made particular exemption for those soldiers who received the gospel when they were already in the military service. Nonetheless, he prescribed them to shirk from the possible sins of military men. Now we go to other church fathers who spoke about the issue, who are Cyprian and Origen. The principal reason of the church fathers' objection to participation towards war, according to Roland H. Bainton, is the shedding of blood. Thus, he emphasized that what was prohib prohibited was the participation in warfare and not in serving as a military, which means that a Christian can be a soldier if he would not kill. Cyprian of Carthage was Tertullian's successor as the most important writer about African Christians. He emphasized that taking of life was not sanctioned. Nonetheless, he recognized that the empire needs a military force, of course. Origen was a brilliant biblical scholar and theologian in the period before Constantine's ascent. He discussed the subject in his article Against Celsus that was written circa 248. Moreover, he stated that Christians should pray that their enemies should die in war. 
and this is a church father. Here he highlighted that defensive wars act as protection from outward threats, meaning that they're uh, in wars, it's like in sports, there's offensive and defensive. It's not bad if you are in the defensive side, not, not the offensive, meaning you are just protecting yourself. Here he highlighted, um, sorry, he did not condemn Christians' participation in military service, but stressed that killing was reproached. He reasoned considering the reality and his counsel and statements became a legacy. The other church father's comments about Christians' participation in military service is more or less the same with Cyprian and Origen, so I, I decided not to put them anyway. The next chapter discusses about the acceptable acceptable functions of soldiers. Additionally, the period that we are living in is a time of peace, just like in their time. Wars are isolated cases. Most countries are enjoying a peaceful environment, especially here in Asia. Thus, church members who are involved in military functions can do so with clear consciences. Affiliate functions, in the time of Pax Romana, meaning peace, Roman peace, it is common for a soldier to function as a police, thus avoiding slaying another individual. Moreover, Vigilis is a military unit in Rome, and the tasks of its affiliates were for fire protection and peacekeeper. Also, Beneficiari was another unit in charge of helping provincial governors in administration. Protectores, protectors, domestici, or domestici were dominated centurions who guarded the emperor and criminals and supervised transportation and communication. So when you say that you are a military in their time, it's not just uh, wartime, or, or they just don't do their jobs by killing other soldiers. It's also through fire protection, through peacekeeper through administra administrational functions in the government and through guarding an important person. Therefore, participation in the military service was allowed because of the diversified functions discussed above and the state of period in involved, which is peaceful and not wartime. Now, we go to Seventh-day Adventist approved function. Ellen G. White stated that the Seventh-day Adventist church member gives service to two governments. First is God's, second is man's, which was ordained by God. Some of the functions from the armed forces that the church encourages are public safety, public health, public morals, and gener general welfare. Public safety, it is necessary that there are people assigned to work for protecting people and their possessions. Crimes and criminals swarm and civilians should be protected from them. Of course, just think if there's no one to take care of our lives and our properties. Public health, the military also assists in public health matters like assisting medical missions. They are also proactive in the education, prevention, and regulation of the use of bad substances especially like drugs, alcohol, and others. Public morals, moral problems in the community are taken care of by the armed men. Thus, some will avoid these offenses out of fear of penalty and punishment. In general welfare, the, there are events which are of national concern that utilize the armed forces such as calamities, emergencies, and others. These rescues from disasters are better done by trained personnel. So just imagine a world without them it will be very hard. And we go to the last chapter, which is summary and conclusion. Some Christians in the first three centuries participated in military service. Moreover, the church and church fathers' objection to their participation was mainly because of the issues of involvement to idolatrous practices and the taking of life. Additionally, Tertullian wrote the Corona to present the possible practices that a Christian military may face that are in opposition to his or her religious beliefs. Christians are free to serve their countries in capacities they are called for. However, certain guidelines should be kept in mind. 
Therefore, it is imperative that as church leaders, members of our church who are contemplating or who are in active service in the armed forces should be guided on how to be faithful Seventh-day Adventists who are rooted in the Word of God while practicing their chosen field of career or even their calling. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now we will give a uh, three person for question and answer. Do you have a question? Okay. Like you mentioned in old times, in Roman times, uh, uh, the soldier or the subordinates, they were subject to their you know, seniors and their commands. No ifs and buts. Even until now, like I had a desire since my childhood, my family is from Air Force and Army, I had a desire to join, but uh, I could not. First, somebody told me, hey, you cannot join armed forces where you have to kill. I said, okay. I was not sure about that, but I believed that person. I said, okay. What I'll go, I'll go to other department. When I talked with them, they said, okay. I got admission for commission, but uh, when it came to Sabbath, the same thing I said, no ifs and no buts. Okay, they said after two years, you can take three holidays, no problem. You will be king of your position. But for uh, two and a half year, no, no Sabbath, no other questions. Like this, even during the training, you'll have to compromise with your beliefs, with your faith also. And you know, uh, since 1,000 people are here, they uh, lead, they provide us, you know, military, kind of military training that is very important, very good for us, for our survival and to uh, give us, you know, good understanding. But there are some things, not in one thought, but those military trainings, where you have to do many things and even eat and survive with the things which are not according to Bible, which are not according to our beliefs. Then what should we do? During training, any of these uh, military and other armed forces, we have to compromise with our belief. Then what should we do? Well, for training, somehow there are religious tolerance. Especially when my brother was studying in PNPA. For food, they have Muslim and non-Muslim, meaning you can eat non-pork. Mm -hmm. Also, they are very good in promoting religion among the trainees. Because they know that if a person is a God-fearer, then he will be a good soldier in the future. So they have also their services, like worship services. However, however, it's not that you can keep the whole day as Sabbath. That's given. Oh. Please don't mind. We Adventists are nothing if we compare ourselves with the prejudice and cutter Muslims. We are nothing, right, about their practices. But yet, there are no ifs and buts. How they have to survive with eating those snakes, frogs, and even slaughtering chickens with their mouth and drinking the blood to survive? There are many other things. You know, there are, it's not like this freedom. Okay, for freedom religious, maybe there are some other provisions, but when you are in training, I don't think, I don't know about the Philippines training, but our trainings, yeah, I know for the last seven years, Pakistan Army is number one army in the whole world. But it's not only Pakistan Army or militaries, other countries as well. In the training, you don't know, you cannot imagine <laughs> what trainings they have to go through. And uh, those, the things which you mentioned, no, no, you cannot compare them with these situations. I'd just like to say, I, I understand this argument because it was one of the things that I had to choose. I am a former United States Marine, um, retired. Um, the choices that I had to make because I was raised as an Adventist to join the Marine Corps was difficult um, because Marines are known to kill people. That's what we do. And I was a combat engineer, which meant the infantry was behind me. I was in front of the infantry. so. 
I was guaranteed to always be in combat. Um, and I came to the conclusion that if I killed somebody, well, I joined the military. It was my job to do that, either be killed or to be killed. And I knew that, and I could accept it. When it came to the Sabbath, uh, being raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, it was very hard, but I understood that there was trainings and there was missions. Now, as a combat engineer, I got to do a lot of neat things. I got to help people. I got to go into disaster area relief, and I got to do more good than I did evil. Um, so to me, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, when I was in training, one of the things that the instructors tried to do was to get me to eat meat. Now, I was raised as a vegetarian, and I chose to stay a vegetarian in the military, and this was at the time when they didn't have the vegetarian MREs. I can tell you that God worked in my life. I can guarantee he worked in my life because I went for over two weeks without eating anything but peanut butter and crackers, and I kept up with the rest of my platoon, and I actually far succeeded them. We did a 20-mile road march. I carried a 60-pound pack. One of my fellow recruits twisted his ankle, wanted to continue to march, but he couldn't carry the pack. I carried his pack for 16 miles, so I was carrying 120 pounds. I only weighed 150. So I know God worked in my life. At the very end, I had um, final phase PFT, and I scored very high, and I did it when I was very sick with 103 f fever. So God worked in my life, not saying that you can't do it, but it is an individual choice, and you have to understand that in it, there is consequences. You're going to have to ch make that choice, whether you're willing or not to, to kill somebody. And that's just a choice. Um, if you're a pastor, obviously you're going to go in as a chaplain and you won't have to do those things. But I went in as an enlisted man and I had to make those choices. So in the United States, it's a lot easier because they have religious tolerance, but still you have to do certain things. Um, a doctor needs to be a doctor on the Sabbath and he saves lives. I protected the Constitution of the United States on the Sabbath. Um, so, yes, I made a compromise in some aspect of the deal, but I believe that God used me. Um, and when my military experience was done, more people understood and accepted Adventism where before they were intolerant against Adventists. And I believe it was because God was using me. So God needs people in every field, but it's a choice that an individual has to make. And there is some real... Um, hard choices that an individual does have to make. So it is not an easy choice, and you have to really think to make it. And if you are a pastor of someone who decides to join, you need to lay out the facts of what's going to happen and then allow them to make the choices and, and not. In my case, I did survival trainings, and we never had to eat anything. They wanted me to eat snake and stuff like that, but I didn't have to. I learned to eat fine plants and stuff because of pathfindering that taught me how to eat wildlife or wild plants. And I was able to teach the instructors what to eat instead of um, a snake or whatever else you can find. So my military experience was more positive than it was negative. I touched more lives because God used me in it. But it was my call at the time. It is where I believe God wanted me to be because it opened up the door. So again, your brothers and father was in the military, was as policemen, they had to make that choice. And there has to make you doing it for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. And I just would like to share that I think that you've done a very good job. Yes. Thank you. One more question. Okay, the last question. I've been asking questions since day one, so I will ask a very quick question this afternoon. If we are given our choices, we can do what we want, but there are countries what we, we wish to do according to the wish of God. But what about 
countries like Korea where they are asked to serve the military. Mandatory. And it is mandatory. What do we do? Okay, I was trying to avoid that, but uh, <laughs> uh, during the World War, I was not sure, one or two, it came to a point when all Americans, were, all, all American men are mandated to enlist. And interestingly, James White, he said that you can, you can join because it's our responsibility, it's our duty as citizen of America to, to protect, to fight for our country. And there was an argument because what if the American Adventist was killing a German Adventist. So it's like an Adventist killing each other in the war. <laughs> but I will run from that topic. In Korea, yeah, the hard problem was the training, but I was told that after you have done the training, then you have an option where you will serve later. So in that way, my proposal is taken care of. Okay, thank you so much. On behalf of our AATS, we'll give the certificate of appreciation to Ellen Composter.